Uh, comrades and friends, good evening and welcome to our latest uh, online socialist policy seminar organised by the Socialist Campaign Group alongside the Labour Assembly Against Austerity and Momentum. Uh, tonight's seminar is called Tax the Rich, the Fight for Wealth Taxes and Tax Justice. This is the fourth uh, of our online socialist policy seminars. Uh, previously, we've looked at the need to end privatisation in the NHS and return to a fully publicly funded, but also publicly owned system. The need for a socialist Green New Deal, the need for public ownership of energy. And we've had thousands of people tuning into this series. Tonight, we have over 600 resignation, uh, resignations, registrations, uh, but many more will see it when it's uh, when it's posted out on social media. Uh, <clears throat> at each one of our sessions, we've had a link up with the Socialist Campaign Group members in Parliament with leading experts and those campaigning and struggling for a better world. And tonight is no exception. We need to build these alliances, uh, working with people uh, who uh, working working on this with working people. Uh, given what was announced last week in the autumn statement. We've got great speakers tonight, as indeed we always have. And the aim is that they speak for around 10 minutes each, and then we have some time uh, for questions. So I'll introduce them as they come up. And our first speaker is Uslem Onoran, Professor of Economics at the University of Greenwich. Uh, Uslem, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for organizing this uh, very timely event and uh, having me. Um, obviously, we have had the autumn statement last week, uh, and this is a very timely response uh, to that very weak uh, statement, which has uh, real cuts to public, public investment and services, while it's very shy on taxing the rich. Uh, really, the conservative budget has very little to genuinely address the crises we face in terms of cost of living, inequalities, care, climate change, housing, uh, or debt crisis of uh, private firms and households. And at this crossroads in history, we not only need to increase public spending to meet the rise in the costs of delivering those services, but we also need a massive paradigm shift to a needs-based approach to fiscal policy, such that we can address both the ecological and the care crises while tackling inequalities. Such a mobilization requires urgent and large scale public investment in the green economy and in the purple care economy. With green economy, I'm talking about massive investment in renewable energy, insulation, energy efficiency of the grid, uh, public transport, as well as other parts of the green economy, such as sustainable organic agriculture, forestry, or investing in the circular economy. With purple care economy, I'm talking about obviously education, childcare, health, and social care, but also uh, investment in social housing. Now, the, while doing that, we need to avoid false dichotomy between these urgent needs. And therefore, we need a solid answer to the question of how can we fund this urgent and large scale public investment mobilization. Partly public investment will be self-financing, so there is money, but it's not a magic tree. If you spend one pound, you're not going to get back the national income and multiplier effects to the extent that you will fund all of it. You need to use all the other tools in your toolkit that of course includes uh, borrowing, as well as national investment bank and monetary policy of the Bank of England, but we need to also use progressive taxation of not only income, but also wealth. And this latter point is the topic of today's discussion. And when I talk about taxing wealth, I mean way beyond just a windfall tax, a temporary or a sector industry specific tax on excessive pro uh, profits. I also mean a lot more than just uh, increasing the tax rates on capital gains or dividends to the same rate as other types of income. Mind you, before we start talking about 
what uh, the schemes of wealth, taxing wealth could be, we should also acknowledge that wealth is more unequally distributed than income, both in terms of aggregate wealth, but also in terms of gender gaps or racial gaps. Wealth accumulates or grows exponentially and the returns to higher wealth is much higher compared to wealth of those at the bottom half of the distribution. The composition at the very top of the wealth distribution is very much skewed towards financial wealth and business wealth. And in the past decade, since the great financial crash of 2008, quantitative easing response of the Bank of England has caused an inflation in asset prices that has actually increased wealth inequality even further. So what we need is progressive taxation of wealth, such that we tax wealth at the top of the distribution and at a much higher rate than uh, other parts of the distribution of income or wealth. This is essential to prevent excessive further wealth concentration. And last but not least, the crises since the pandemic increased wealth inequality further. Over the pandemic, the wealth of the billionaires in Britain grew by 22%. The share of the top 1% in total wealth in Britain increased further as of 2021, this is standing at 21.3%. Uh, so before I go in uh, to our proposal of a progressive wealth tax uh, scheme, I just want to debunk one myth. What happens when you tax wealth? Well, a lot of good things happen in the macro sense. First of all, it does decrease wealth concentration. It does decrease wealth inequality. The share of the top 1% in total wealth would decrease if you introduce a progressive wealth taxation. The mainstream would tell you that, oh, but this would be bad for private investment. That's wrong. Our analysis show that if you tax wealth and decrease wealth inequality, it is good for private investment, and in turn, it's good for the productivity of the economy. It is contrary to the common wisdom. Why is that so? Because wealth inequality is going uh, hand in hand with financial speculation, accumulation of financial assets. It's not going hand in hand with investing in machinery and capital stock. It's another way of financialization of our economy. Wealth inequality is synonymous to market power, market concentration. And this is one of the key barriers to investment and innovation and entry to an industry by the powerful oligopolies concentrating, holding the wealth uh, in the country and in an industry. So if you take wealth macroeconomically, what you do at the same time is to stimulate the private investment of the bottom 99% of the entrepreneurs. It has a very strong positive effect on output. It does create a lot of jobs for women and men, and it does contribute massively to the budget balance. Uh, I have more things to say comparing the macro effects that can come from taxing wealth compared to taxing labor income. But just one thing is important here to emphasize, if you tax labor income, that actually suppresses demand in the economy, that takes away from the working class households, and that has a negative effect on aggregate national income. It is not good for private investment either in that sense. So the negative effects that you could think that can come from taxing wealth, as well as the profit income, is actually uh, a lot smaller compared to the ne negative impact of taxing labor income. Now, what is our proposal? You can think about many different uh, ways of putting the numbers on the table. I'm going to give you just one example here. Based on the research that we have done at Greenwich with my colleagues Ben Tippett and Raphael Wildauer last year, our principle was 
to say, let's start taxing wealth, net wealth, that is assets minus liabilities. Let's do it at the household level, such that individuals can't do creative accounting. And let's start taxing this net wealth at a very high threshold, such that A, we don't hurt the savings of working class households, but B, we are also aiming to tackle a small number of households to be valued. We have here uh, colleagues from PCS together uh, with us tonight. Um, they will know uh, more about how we can um, measure, evaluate, and avoid tax avoidance and tax evasion. But of course, the smaller the number of households to be valued, the easier will be the job of uh, those uh, tax auditors. What the next thing we suggest as a principle is let's include all assets such that rich households can't avoid go for creative accounting, looking for exemptions and reliefs. All assets from land to our business assets to financial assets. And then let's start with this high threshold with a 1% tax on the top 1% wealthiest households. As I say, this is just an example. We know uh, the data from the uh, British Wealth and Asset Survey very well. We have ways of also measuring uh, the uh, misreporting in that survey because the rich uh, avoid answering to questions uh, or they are more likely to do so compared to us. But from the numbers we have from the Office of National Statistics Survey, when we talk about the top 1% wealthiest households, we are talking about 260,000 households in Britain. This is a lot easier to monitor than targeting a larger uh, pool of households. But if this is the democratic decision, we could well look at the numbers uh, for that scheme as well. So the top 1% household in Britain has a net wealth that is about 3.4 million pounds. What we are suggesting is let's start taxing that group at a well, tax rate of 1%. Then let's introduce another threshold targeting the top 0.5%. These are households that have wealth, net wealth, about 5.7 million pounds. We are proposing to tax their wealth about 1.7 million at a marginal wealth tax rate of 5%. And then for the top, one per thousand, that's 0.1 percent of households who have a wealth about 18.2 million pounds. Um, we are saying let's tax them at a marginal tax rate of 10 percent. Now, this scheme would raise a minimum of 70 billion pounds tax revenues a year, even if we assume that there will be about 50% tax evasion. If we staff uh, our tax office, HMRC, much better, equip them with stronger tools, uh, more people, and manage to decrease tax evasion to only 15%, we could raise with this scheme about 130 uh, billion pounds. That's a lot of money to tax. That is between nine to 16% of total tax revenues currently in Britain, even after accounting for administration costs and as I have said, tax avoidance. So there's a lot of untapped tax revenue potential in the world of the top 1%. Mind you, I see the taxation of wealth as a key policy tool such that we can shift our fiscal policy paradigm towards a needs-based fiscal policy, such that we can invest in the green economy and the care economy for a green, purple, red, green and caring just transition. Uh, but taxation of wealth is also an aim on its own if you want to time this exponential accumulation of wealth 
at the top of one percent. Okay. Today we to focus on yeah. Yep. I'll be wrap up, up by saying I focused on wealth taxation. Obviously, we could talk about also more progressive taxation of income. For example, one proposal we had was to talk about a much higher top marginal income tax rate of about 70% for income about 10 times the median income. Median income today in Britain is about 33,000 pounds a year. Um, and 10 times of that would be a new tax bracket about uh, 330,000 pounds a year. Mind you to put that okay. into context, yeah, autumn statement was a lot more shy and I'm happy to also remind you of what the British top marginal income tax rate was back in the 1974-79. But I'll stop here and look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much for your patience. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, well, our, our second speaker uh, is a, a comrade of mine, a socialist member of the House of Lords, and he is living proof that accountancy is not boring. He describes himself as a humble accountant rather than a tax expert. And I tell you, he never misses any opportunity in the House of Lords to say how appalling the, uh, the policies of this current government are, even before the awfulness of the cuts and the tax rises wished on us in last week's budget. So Prem Sikha, Lord Sikha, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Christine, and hello, everyone. And I'm very grateful to the organizers uh, for this opportunity to speak. Let me just take take us back to the sort of the dawn of the crisis that we find ourselves in. Its foundations were really laid during the rise of neoliberalism during the time of Margaret Thatcher. And uh, I'm afraid governments operate with smoke and mirrors. So let me just read you a quote from the chief economic advisor to Margaret Thatcher who subsequently, in year 2010, gave an interview and said this. And this is a quote from Sir Alan Budd. He said, I was involved in making a number of proposals, which were partly at least adopted by the government and put in play by the government. Now, my worry is that there may have been people making the actual policy decisions who never believed for a moment that this was the correct way to bring down inflation. They did, however, see that it would be a very, very good way to raise unemployment, and raising unemployment was an extremely desirable way of reducing the strength of the working classes. If you like, that, that is what was engineered there in Marxist terms was a crisis of capitalism which recreated a reserve army of labor and has allowed capitalists to make high profits ever since. And it is this high profiteering and profits which is really the cause of many of our problems. So in 1976, the workers' share of the GDP in the form of wages and salaries was 65.1%, and now it is around 50%. So basically, working class workers have continued to be weakened. And the budget introduced last week, if, if the Conservative government is there long enough to carry out its policies, what that would mean is that uh, uh, it will be 2027 by the time the real wages lead, uh, reach the level they were in 2008. So we have an immense amount of poverty. So workers' wages have been reduced, but the state's share of the GDP in the form of taxes has been constant, somewhere between 32 and 33%. That has been the case since the mid-1960s. So who has actually gained it from the workers? The answer is capital. Capital's share of the GDP has increased massively. But that has not led to higher wages for the people. That has not led to higher investment in productive assets. What it has led to is higher dividends, higher share buybacks. Major corporations are paying up to 80% of their earnings in dividends. And the UK average 
tax burden, as it were, is uh, less uh, is less than the average for the OECD uh, countries. So that is what really the source of our crisis is. Capital running amok, states nakedly siding with capital. Uh, and when the states do not align themselves with the masses, there is always a crisis. And that is the crisis that we uh, have. So how do we actually address this? Now, of course, uh, those who are familiar with a modern monetary theory would have a different solution. But regrettably, in neoliberal circles, that does not have a lot of traction. So I'm just going to focus on taxation. Now, since 2010, HMR, HMRC says that it has actually failed to collect 400 billion pounds of taxes. There are some others who estimate this number to be 1,500 billion pounds. That is one and a half trillion pound. Just imagine if the government was really clamping down on tax avoidance, tax evasion, fraud, how our lives could be transformed. Governments ritually make that claim, but they actually do very little. So Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, again last week, we are going to clamp down on tax avoidance. And then I'll look at the Treasury's uh, papers, which were published after his speech. What do I find? I find this. HMRC's budget for this year is 5.9 billion. For 2023-24, that is next year, it will be 5.6 billion. And year after, it is set to be 4.6 billion pounds. That is a massive real cut, given the double digit rate of inflation. There is a little chance, or indeed a little desire by the government to clamp down on uh, tax uh, avoidance. That's, um, uh, it simply is not really uh, doing that. There are many other ways of raising additional uh, tax revenues if the government so wishes. For example, by aligning the taxation of earned income and unearned income. Currently, unearned income is taxed at a much, much lower rate uh, than earned income. For example, capital gains are taxed between, uh, at the rate between 10% and 28%, whereas earned income is taxed between the rate of 20% and 45%. If you were to align that and charge national insurance, contribute, char charge national insurance to recipients of capital gains, because currently they don't pay any, even though they use the NHS and social care, that would raise 25 billion pounds from just about 250,000 people. If you were to align the tax rates on dividends with uh, the tax rates on earned income, that could raise another 10 to 15 billion pounds. Again, remember the examples I'm giving you do not result in any tax increase for the masses, that is for the 95% of workers. They are simply dealing with anomalies or tax perks, if, if, if you like. Now, if we were at the moment, uh, national insurance is paid at the rate of 12% on earnings between 12,570 pounds and 50,270. Income above that, taxable income above that, only attracts national insurance at the rate of percent. Suppose we charge 12% on all income. That would raise another 15 billion pounds a year. Of course, we could recalibrate the national insurance uh, charge. They could argue, for example, instead of 12%, people on lower pay would only pay 10%. So there are numerous possibilities, ways of redistributing, ways of helping the people at the bottom. Government with this money could even, if it so wishes, uh, uh, abolish a, a VAT on domestic fuel or reduce the general rate of VAT. We all, we all know that the indirect taxes are incredibly uh, re regressive. Uh, governments could uh, look at the tax relief being handed out uh, to uh, corporations and wealthy individuals. Altogether, 1,140 tax reliefs are given by the government. 
However, the government is going to produce a list of how of the cost of each of these uh, tax reliefs. They include, for example, helping companies with uh, 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 research and development. They include what they call uh, uh, enterprise investment schemes, entrepreneurs relief. They even give tax relief to, uh, to orchestras, but not to pop concerts. It is always loaded against uh, the, the entertainment and the culture of the masses. If you want to go and listen to an orchestra, you would find there would be a tax subsidy. You want to go and listen to a pop concert, there is no subsidy. So, so again, uh, we don't know the full cost, but HMRC admits that just 424 of these uh, reliefs cost 400 billion pound a year. So what exactly is the business case for awarding these reliefs? What, what kind of benefits does economy and society as a whole receive? We are not really told anything uh, about this uh, at all. We are also giving tax relief uh, for creating inequalities. For example, uh, the fees paid to private schools, where people like Boris Johnson and Sunak and many others have been, well, they don't pay any VAT on that. And, and, and those schools also qualify as charities, and they only pay 20% of the business rate. Suppose we abolish that, that would raise uh, billions too. So again, there is a lot of money uh, waiting uh, to be uh, collected. The government is actually telling us that it has embraced some version of progressive taxation. You would have heard Jeremy Hunt telling us that he's reduced the threshold for the 45% band of income tax from 150,000 to 125,140 pounds. Now, if you did quick sums, you will find that that results in an additional tax payment of 1,243 pounds a year. That is the burden on somebody earning 150,000 or 5 million pounds. Works out at about 24 pound a week, which is just about the cost of a glass of wine for a FTSE executive uh, earning 4 million pound a year. That is not progressive taxation at all in, in my book, and it does not really meet uh, that requirement uh, at all. Now, UK also exports a lots and lots of income without, being, without any taxation. So you, if you're riding on a train, chances are the train is owned by a foreign company or a foreign government. EDF is owned by French government. Governments, a lot of our energy is supplied by foreign governments. So when these companies pay dividends, there is zero taxation. UK is one of the few countries, perhaps the only one on this planet, which does not levy a withholding tax, does not deduct a tax at source. So it could begin to deduct tax at source. So if typically 100 billion plus is paid out in dividends in a year, if around 20 billion of that goes abroad at the rate and the, the withholding taxes at 25%, that would generate uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, tax uh, for our benefit. Okay, and can of I course, wrap up in a minute? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so basically, the socialist way of taxing is not to tax the poor. The proposal that I have made would simply eliminate the anomalies and also the tax perks enjoyed by the rich. We want to treat them just like anybody else. And that would raise billions and billions for our public services and for redistribution and for alleviating poverty. The only thing that we need is a socialist government. How right you are, Prem. Thank you so much. That's great. OK, uh, so comrades and friends, now we were going to be joined by Fran Heathcote, uh, the president of PCS, but unfortunately she can't uh, join us this evening. But we are very pleased to have with us Martin Kavanagh, who is the PCS deputy president, who's going to look at the forthcoming PCS strike action and why we simply cannot have another round of austerity. Martin, the floor is yours. Brilliant, Christine. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the organiser of tonight's uh, event to ask me along to, to speak and address 
this really important meeting, because as we just heard from the first two speakers tonight, we are about to embark on yet another wave of austerity, when I think it is quite clear to anybody who has paid any attention to the details, not just the new autumn budget, but some of the rhetoric that's coming out from this government right now, that the people who are really going to be expected to pay for the ongoing economic crisis are the lowest earners, low-paid workers, the sick and the disabled. Whether that's directly through cuts and oppression of wages, or whether it's through the decimation of services that are absolutely vital to some of the most vulnerable in our society. It is those individuals in our communities who are going to be footing the bill for this next round of austerity. And none of us should be surprised by that, because we all know that every time there is an economic crisis, it's never the wealthiest, it's never the richest in the country who have that disproportionate um, call upon their, their wealth or their earnings. It is always that the lowest paid and those at the 95%. Uh, so I just want to touch really on, on where we are as a union and what we are trying to achieve in the coming weeks and months. Because we have seen, I think, throughout the summer, a growing increase in the narrative that people just cannot any longer accept or indeed cope with the lowest paid and the poorest in society, those who desperately need the help of the government and the wealthiest, always been on the receiving end of cuts and further cutbacks. And so what we have seen is workers literally in the truest sense rising up throughout this year to challenge that narrative, to actually say that there is an alternative and the alternative cannot just be about the Tories protecting their own and protecting the wealthiest. The narrative has to change because those who kept this country going throughout the pandemic, those who continue to put their own and their families' lives at risk during a pandemic to keep vital services going are the ones ultimately who are now being expected to foot the bill. And that narrative, we believe, has to change. I don't think it will come as a shock to anyone on this call tonight there are members who are government, mainly government workers, whether you work in HMRC, whether you work in the Department for Work and Pensions, whether you work in Border Force, in Home Office, or do other vital public services, working for the government, where the government is your employer. It won't come as any shock to anyone on this call tonight that we have seen, and our members have seen, the sharpest drop in living standards that we have seen, not only in decades, but I would argue in generations. And I don't say that lightly. I don't say that to be emotive or to be in any way, shape or form jingoistic. I say that because the very harsh reality that our members are facing right now is one of not just low pay, but very real poverty. And the reason we know that is that we have spent an entire year surveying our members, talking to our members in meetings, both face to face and online, <laughs> taking testimonies from our members. And we know now that in the civil service alone, we have somewhere in a region of over 40,000 civil servants who are paid so poorly that they have to claim the benefits that they administer. 40,000 civil servants who have accepted in writing to us with their names often alongside those testimonies that they're having to rely on food banks. Members having to skip meals. Members already, even before the big increase in, in the energy bills, have been for months choosing between the food on the table and whether or not they put the heating on, food on the table or whether or not they put the electricity on at night. And our members have been telling us in their tens of thousands that they can't carry on like this. So what is it that we want to see what, what, as, as a union? What is it that we are campaigning for? Well, very much the ideology and the ideas that are just being portrayed by the first two comrades in their responses tonight. A better fairer and more just taxation system, one that absolutely, absolutely targets those who can contribute the most, whilst at the same time bringing in vital money to the economy so we can continue to protect the vital public services that more and more now millions are having to call upon throughout these difficult times. And last week's budget, unfortunately, I think we would all agree does nothing to address the narrative or does nothing to change the emphasis of the ongoing the taxation system. Our members know, uh, and you know, Prem has just outlined there the promises or the assurances that the, you know, the Prime Minister uh, last week and also the new Chancellor 
were given about clamping down on tax evasion and tax avoidance. Well, our members in HMRC know that that is just a strap line that is thrown out there for the good of the media and for good for the good of those who just want to buy that narrative. They know that it's not real. They know it's not true. And the reason they know it's not true is because they are the ones in HMRC who day in, day out, administer the taxation system in this country. They understand that after decades of cutbacks, decades of budget restraints, decades of losing re proper genuine resource, that we now have a taxation system. So not only is it fit, not fit for purpose in terms of delivering the changes that we would like to see, but it's not even fit for purpose for clamping down on tax avoidance and tax evasion. So when we know that our members in HMRC are telling us that they have lost hundreds, if not thousands, of collective years of experience just in the last decade due to job cuts and office closures, leaving absolutely vital services in HMRC and our ability to chase down those who are avoiding evading tax at a standstill often. People who they understand are the ones who are genuinely creaming off the top. We're international tax avoidance and evasion. We do not have the tools within HMRC and our members don't have the tools to genuinely chase that down. All of which, as you've already heard, could bring billions of pounds into our economy. The loss of those jobs, the loss of those offices, the loss of those vital services when you could just go along and pop into your tax office for advice and help and support has all been cut back. And yet when it comes to the richest and wealthiest, we as a, as a department, we as a union and our members of our union tell us day in, day out that they can't really chase down the ones who we need to be chasing down. And the Ulton budget last week doesn't give us any hope, unfortunately, because it is quite clear to anyone who's seen that, that budget that what we now can expect is further cuts, further attacks on our resources, and Prem's just give some figures there, but also as well a narrative that cutting back on public spending is a necessity and is absolutely essential if we are going to make allow our economy to grow. Well, we don't buy that. We never have bought that. And that's why we've worked hard with other campaign organisations for years about a tax justice scheme, a, a different narrative, an alternative to what we currently face. And in finishing, I, I will say this, that even before last week's budget, we had PCS economists, people whose job it is to actually give forecasts for the various government departments, telling us that if there are any more cuts in budgets, or any more cuts in resourcing, that would leave us in a position where we would likely lose round about six billion pound, six billion pound in taxation in this country, in revenue coming into this country. That is something that is now a very real possibility after last week's statement. So what are we doing and what are we arguing for? Well, we are all arguing for tax, just a, uh, tax justice. We are arguing for a change in narrative to get rid of the non-dom uh, non-dom status. We are arguing that can bring over three billion pounds into our economy. We are arguing for extra resources, not further cutbacks and further rollbacks, but genuine, proper funded civil servants who can come in and do the job that we all desperately need them to do, which is bring vital money into our economy. And what are we going to do to deliver that? Well, the finishing, I would say this: that last uh, ten days ago now we delivered and announced the biggest ever yes vote for industrial action that we have ever delivered as a union. A national union with 86% yes vote on over a 51% uh, mandate from our members is something that we have never achieved before to that level. And that just doesn't, doesn't tell you about how angry our members are. That tells you how desperate our members are and how keen our members are to fight, not just for their jobs and for their standard of living, but for the absolutely vital services that are continued to be provided by our members for decades. 126 different employer groups have beaten the anti-trade union laws and beaten that 50% threshold. So we have a live mandate now for action in those 126 areas. Unfortunately, not in HMRC, but we will go there again. And I am confident we will deliver that mandate there. But in our biggest department, the Department for Work and Pensions, we are where we only three weeks ago had to deliver a 156 page dossier of testimonies about the economic crisis is having on our members working in DWP. 
those who provide frontline benefits having to claim those frontline benefits, mm -hmm. having to go off sick because they can't afford to either work from home because they can't put the electricity on or come into the office because they can't afford the fares to and from the office. And so we are demanding a fair and decent pay rise. We are demanding job <clears> security. <throat> but that goes hand in hand. The job security goes absolutely hand in hand with our members being allowed to continue to provide absolutely critical public services that we aren't just happy with and pleased with, but that we can be proud of and generally look after the most vulnerable. Our members have spoken. Our members are prepared to take action to deliver those services, to deliver that better economy and to fight for what is right. Action will be taken. And if the government doesn't sit and take notice, if the narrative around taxation and a narrative around fairness in this country and the redistribution of wealth in this country doesn't change, then workers will quite rightly have to withdraw their labour to get their voices heard. We're prepared to do it. I want to thank you again for inviting us tonight. Solidarity, everyone, and look forward to the questions. Uh, Martin, thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, and solidarity, obviously, to all the PCS members uh, who will be taking action. And we look forward to your successful ballot in HMRC in the near future. Um, our next speaker is Richard Bergen, MP. If any of you have seen him uh, on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or any of those many places, you will have seen some of the outstanding speeches he's been making in the chamber in the House of Commons campaigning in Parliament for wealth taxes. So, Richard, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Christine. And it's also great to hear from uh, Oslem, from uh, Prem uh, and from uh, Martin uh, as well. I just wanted to talk really uh, about uh, what is a new attack on workers' living standards and what we can do about it. Because the reality is that the outlook for the general economy is eye-wateringly bad. <laughs> but, but for the living standards, the vast majority, it's even worse than bad. It's truly horrific. Our economy is now in a recession. It's expected to last uh, over a year. It's the only one of the major economies not to have recovered its pre-pandemic levels and it's not set to do so until the end of 2024. Worse still, over the next two years alone, they're, they're going to fall by 7%. So fall in living standards by uh, 7%. That's the largest fall on record. Now, of course, when we talk about this worsening economic situation, we can't forget the class politics of it all, how this affects the 99%, how this affects the 1%. We hear a lot about the cost of living crisis, the truth is it's not a crisis for the elites. For them, it's boom time. British billionaires have been increasing their wealth by £220 million every single day. So much so that there's never been so many UK billionaires. Company profits are up 34%. Bankers' bonuses are up 28%. Bosses' pay at the largest 100 companies is up 23%. And gas and oil companies are making £2,000 per second, per second in profits. So the Guardian ran a very revealing piece last week on how luxury champagne companies are running out of stock as the wealthy spend huge amounts on luxury goods. So it's no wonder that the Sunday Times says that we're in a golden era for the super rich. Essentially, we need to understand this key point. The rich are getting richer because the poor are getting poorer. In the era of neoliberalism, the share of the economy going in wages, in other words, the workers' slice of the pie, has plummeted from 60% to less than half today. So that's hundreds of billions of pounds each year that should be going to workers that isn't. Quite simply, it's daylight robbery. And of course, in this era of neoliberalism, the share going to workers has been cut in other ways as well. Cuts to the welfare state, cuts to public services, cuts to pensions. Also, through the huge privatisations of much of the public sector, which amounts to a handover from the working class to the capitalist class. And this trend of handing over wealth from the majority to the elite is ongoing. Let's look at wages, for example. We're in the longest squeeze on wages in 200 years. Real wages are now not expected to return to their 2008 level until 
2027. That's 20 years of lost wages. Had wages instead continued to grow at their pre-crisis rate during this unprecedented pay freeze, they would be £15,000 per year higher. And they're going to keep trying to drive the share going to the working class down. The autumn statement is full of bad news with cuts and tax hikes, most after the next election. They want the new consensus to be that we need austerity 2.0. So our movement mustn't give an inch on this. Not a single penny in cuts, tax the rich. That needs to be our motto, our maxim. And with everything people have suffered over the last decade, we can easily win the argument that austerity is not the solution. In fact, austerity will worsen things. It's a doom loop that will further slow down growth, reduce people's incomes, worsen the public finances and destroy key services. We can also be confident that the public will back us and is also very supportive of bold measures to raise billions from the wealthiest as part of our alternative. Because one new poll shows broad support for the wealthiest to pay more in taxes, including from 16 to 10 2019 Conservative voters. So there is an alternative popular to the uh, line of some commentators in the media. There is an alternative. Our response needs to be about growing the economy through state investments in the interests of the many. We need to be about growing it in areas of great social need, the planet, green jobs and public services. But our alternative also needs to be about redistribution, taking back control of the economy and what has been taken from the working class over decades. And there's huge scope for increasing tax revenues on wealth. For example, introducing an annual wealth tax, an annual tax of just 1% on all net wealth above £10 million would raise nearly £10 billion per year, according to the UK Wealth Tax Commission. It would affect just the wealthiest 0.04% of the population. So just the wealthiest 0.04%. Just a tax would only apply to wealth over 10 million. And so, for example, someone with 12 million pounds in assets would pay 20,000 pounds in that annual wealth tax. We also need to end the lower tax rates for capital gains and share dividends. Someone who lives off the income they get from share dividends or the income they get from profit when selling assets like second homes currently pays less in tax than someone earning the same amount of money by going out to work for a living. So that's simply indefensible. Scrapping these tax advantages would raise around £22 billion per year. And when those Tory MPs shout and scream about uh, this, we should remind them that even Margaret Thatcher's own Chancellor, Nigel Lawson, raised capital gains tax rates to match income tax rates. And the Treasury's own Office of Tax Simplification actually recommended this to the then Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, back in 2020. We should also extend national insurance contributions to investment income. National insurance contributions only apply to earnings from work and not to all income. They're not paid, for example, on rental income from property. An excellent new ready reckoner on wealth taxes shows that extending national insurance contributions to investment income could raise another £10 billion alone. We also need to uh, scrap non-DOM status. Rishi Sunak's own family's tax affairs brought the scandal of non-DOM taxes back into the public spotlight earlier this year. Scrapping its tax advantage, as Labour's calling for, could raise up to £3 billion per year. And new research shows just 0.3% of those affected would leave Britain as a result. That's fewer than 100 people, most of whom are paying hardly any tax under the current non-DOM regime. Those four measures alone that I've just mentioned would raise 45 billion pounds and further vast sums could be raised by extending windfall taxes to areas of the economy where companies are clearly profiteering or clearly making excess profits out of this crisis 
Spain's progressive government is doing just that with its plans for a windfall tax on banks. And we should also go after the big polluters who are driving the climate crisis. We should start by raising billions by closing the deliberate loophole in the Tories' energy windfall tax that meant that Shell avoided paying any taxes in the UK this year, despite record global profits. So in conclusion, there's been a lot of focus on how the last 12 weeks of conservative chaos have worsened the economic situation and led to the need for cuts and led to the need for tax hikes. But the truth actually is the terrible attack on living standards is a result of 12 years of conservative economic policies. Policies based on austerity, privatisation, wage freezes for the vast majority, profiteering and milking the state to further enrich the wealth of the elite. So we need to sweep that broken model into the dustbin of history. That means fighting austerity 2.0 head on. It also means laying out a bold alternative that can deal with the scale of crisis that we face, wealth taxes on those that are doing very well indeed from our current rigged economy need to be a key part of that. Thank you. Richard, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'm pleased to say that uh, that you explained that business about where we can get the money from so brilliantly on TV that I hope that millions and millions of people have seen that. Um, we've now got I've got a question for each of the panelists. So I'm going to I'm going to read out the questions now. So, you know, that you don't have to answer everything. You just have to answer your question. So. So here we go. This is a question for Uslem first. But I'll read them all before I ask you to answer. Aslam, as we're fighting austerity, we need to save the planet. What green taxes could we implement? For Prem, the second question, how do we deal with the argument that the rich will simply leave if we tax them more? For Martin, uh, one of our comrades says, I'm reading the Ragged Trouser Philanthropist. The system is still stacked against the working class on purpose. How does society change this? Just a little easy question for you there, Martin. And, uh, and Richard, um, someone has asked that we look at the mental health crisis that extreme wealth causes in people, which is a kind of interesting idea. What do you think of that? Certainly causes a lot of, uh, a lot of problems in people who are not extremely wealthy anyway. So over to you, Aslam, first, the question about green taxes. Thank you very much. I am in favor of investing and steering the economy uh, rather than leaving dirty uh, economy, brown economy, brown energy uh, as it is, and just tax it. Um, the, the reason for that is the following. Uh, if you tax uh, the use of brown energy, if you tax uh, the use of uh, airlines at a higher rate than we are doing today, the rich will still uh, won't bother. They will not be sensitive to the change in the price of uh, these dirty sectors of the economy. They have a lot of income. What we call in economics is that they're not elastic to prices. By taxing, putting green taxes, you're just increasing the price. They're gonna nevertheless consume it. Um, by taxing uh, beef at a higher rate, you will increase the price, they will anyway eat it. What we need is to grow our own, to grow, publicly owned renewable energy sector in solar, in uh, wind, in hydropower, small scale hydropower, geothermal energy, tidal power in this country, um, and provide it with the principle of access to basic, uh, a basic amount of energy for everyone. Um, it's a very affordable price, um, subsidized price. Now, and in the meantime, uh, plan a radical uh, deployment away from fossil fuels, uh, dirty energy, um, including nuclear energy, risky energy, 
um, and uh, basically shut down these by replacing them with clean energy, increase energy efficiency uh, by insulating homes, providing that as a public uh, service, increase industrial energy efficiency, upgrade the grid, and it has to be nationally owned. And when it comes to uh, agriculture, grow our own organic, sustainable, plant-based agriculture. Um, along with that, I wouldn't object to in a transition phase, having some green taxes on things that we want to um, gradually uh, stop consuming or at least decrease the consumption uh, of. Uh, but particularly when it comes to essential things where we think it's a human right to have access to uh, a sufficient en uh, amount of energy or to have access to decent food, I would be very much inclined towards providing these or creating a public infrastructure for expanding the supply of these collectively. And I use public or collective in a very broad sense here. It could be uh, centrally owned, it could be uh, municipally owned, or it could be simply supporting uh, cooperatives. Uh, but what is needed really is our own green investment and green taxes can only play some role in changing the behavior of people if it is embedded into this very large green public investment program. Otherwise, it will only hurt the poor, but still not decrease the emissions because world's majority of emissions are being emitted by, again, the top 1% wealthiest that is across the world, uh, not okay. just in this country. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. OK, Prem, over to you. How do we deal with the argument that the rich will simply leave if we tax them more? Well, some might, but uh, US evidence suggests that tax is not the only reason why. Uh, sorry, uh, just some signs propped up here. Uh, mm. US evidence suggests that tax is not the only reason why some rich people want to live in a particular place. There are all kinds of other reasons, ease of transport, the environment, uh, protection of property rights, access to all kinds of services. And indeed, we have a movement in the UK called Patriotic Millionaires who've been writing open letters to the government saying, please tax us more. <laughs> they want to pay more because they do realise that the inequalities that we have and the erosion of public services is not good for them, not good for people, and indeed not good for businesses. So businesses can't get an educated workforce, or when their employees are ill, they can't get decent health care, they themselves lose. So I don't buy this argument that they will all leave. Uh, obviously, some will leave, and if they want to go, I will not really stop them, because... <laughs> We need to build a decent society for everyone, not just for a fraction of 1%. Thanks ever so much, Prem. I can, I can attest to this, this UK patriotic millionaires. Prem invited some of them in, and we had a very, very interesting meeting with them where actually they were saying, yes, we should pay more tax. So, uh, Martin, over to you. Uh, one of our uh, participants is reading The Ragged Trouser Philanthropist. How do we change society since it's still stacked against the working class? Yeah, well, yeah, wow, Christine. Um, <laughs> in five minutes, I'll, I'll try and achieve something that we've not quite managed to do in the last couple of hundred years. But, but, but what, what I would like to say is this, that the unions in particular, trade unions, are, there's, there's two things that I think that they, if you like, have fallen foul of over the years. One is clearly falling foul of the right-wing media and the right-wing media narrative like being very anti-trade union and against unions or being being very successful in trying to make it out as if trade unions are only interested in the interest of their own individual membership and those of us who've been around any length of time in unions know that that just plainly is not true so i think there are three things in particular that that we can do to to all around changing the narrative but that we we, we can do and should do uh, as a movement, not just trade unions themselves, but us uh, as a movement. First of all, I think we should not be shy in filling every single space and every single opportunity that we can get, whether it's on the in the media, whether it's attending you know rallies and seminars such as this, 
or whether it's doing you know town meetings and going into communities to actually confirm what it is we are a about and b are trying to achieve on behalf behalf of wider society because i think what we as a movement have perhaps fallen foul of for too long is trying to convince those who perhaps aren't in the trade unions or aren't in communities that actually we care about them and what we're trying to do for our members will benefit them in the long run as well because you cannot have economic growth while you are continuing to suppress millions and millions and millions of workers. You cannot have vibrant communities if you are making it impossible for workers to either spend their money in those communities or services are being decimated within those communities. And we need to build links. We, we don't just build links with each other. We don't just give each other solidarity, but actually we take our argumentation into, into those communities to explain exactly what it is we are trying to deliver. And an absolute key point for, for me and for our union is this, that I think for too long, it's been too easy for the movement to say how bad things are. We actually have to give a clear and understandable alternative to what is the narrative. So we've heard that word tonight a lot, haven't we? Alternative. It's no good, good just pointing out what's going wrong. We have to provide a clear strategy and a clear alternative. Our union has been trying to do that with you know, the tax justice campaign, trying to build it links to that. In my own um, group in DWP, I'm group president of DWP. We've worked brilliantly with Unite Community, for example, over the years, with people like Richard as well, to get you know, questions raised in the House of, of, of Parliament, not just about our members, but about the services that our members are providing and why it's important uh, to, to try and, and get that narrative across. So we build those links. We give clear alternative strategies to the right-wing narrative that is all too often uh, all, all too often prevalent. And let's face it, when we need to, we absolutely join forces and collectivise to ram socialism down everyone's throats, quite frankly, because it hasn't been long enough. <laughs> That'll do me. Thank you very much, Martin. OK, and uh, just before I come to you, Richard, with your question, I just want to say that we uh, we had hoped that Zara Sultana might have been able to join us on this call. But uh, the reason she's not here is because she's in the chamber talking about the or talking on the autumn statement and talking about the importance of raising uh, taxation on wealth, raising wealth taxes. So uh, we've got a second round coming up. But here's your first round question, Richard. Someone has asked that we look at the mental crisis that extreme wealth causes in people. And then the question is, what do you think of that? Well, you know, clearly people seeing people being extremely wealthy when they can, you know, when they're deciding between heating and eating, that must be a significant issue. Richard, over to you. Well, it's uh, well established, isn't it, that uh, societies that are more equal uh, tend to be uh, happier and people remember the book uh, from uh, a long time ago now but still relevant the uh, the spirit level which goes through uh, the data uh, behind that like at my uh, advice sessions uh, up in my constituency in Leeds uh, every week you know I'm meeting people who are under great stress people are really suffering people who um, are really suffering the mental ill health effects uh, of poverty, of not being able to make ends meet, but also of grotesque inequality in our society uh, as well. Uh, and th the way our whole society uh, works, the way the economic system tells people that they're only a success if they become obscenely wealthy themselves. And obviously most people the vast, vast majority of people never accrue such extreme amounts uh, of wealth. So in a strange way, society tells them that they're somehow lacking or have somehow failed when the um, the message uh, in much of advertising as well and the algorithms on uh, social media seem to project this idea that uh, we all should uh, seek to and somehow uh, acquire uh, the these lavish lifestyles of the super rich, uh, lifestyles which are by definition unattainable for the vast majority uh, in society. And at the same time, people are struggling to get even uh, the basics, people choosing between eating or eating, people struggling to keep a, ro a roof above their heads, people struggling to pay the mortgage, struggling to 
pay their rent, people struggling to afford Christmas presents uh, for their children, uh, people struggling to um, pay to get on the public transport and uh, travel around to see their friends or family or to uh, keep uh, a car running. And so I think the priorities of our system have to be changed. We need just a, a system um, that puts uh, people, yes, and planets also before the pursuit of profit in a system that actual, actually values the contribution people make. It doesn't just tell everybody that uh, we should all try to be like uh, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or uh, Donald Trump in his pre-president uh, incarnation. Uh, and somehow these are the role models for our society. Because it seems to me that our society, or not our society, because people make up society and most people uh, have a better way uh, of, of viewing the world. But much of social media, much of the media, much of the political class, much of the economic leadership uh, of our uh, society sell this idea that somehow key workers and working people can be devalued and aren't important and that the really important people in our society are the billionaires. And as I said in my comments earlier, we've never had as many billionaires uh, in uh, Britain. And so I think we do need to understand that inequality and poverty causes physical ill health and illnesses. And you see the uh, disparity between life expectancy in the poorest areas of, of our country compared to the more wealthy uh, areas, but also as well as physical ill health, it causes mental ill health. And that's something that we need to be fighting against, you know, and we are the sixth biggest economy uh, in the world. People shouldn't be suffering from physical health or mental ill health as a result of the grotesque inequality in our society. So we need a fairer redistribution uh, of the wealth in our society, but also think we need to make the argument of who are, and I'll finish on this, who are the heroes in our society? Are the heroes care workers, nurses, doctors, transport workers, school staff, factory workers, people who produce food? Are they the heroes? Are they the people who keep society running? I believe they are. Or is it these people that were told are the wealth creators who don't create any wealth at all, but just suck wealth up like Robin Hood in reverse? The billionaires who are getting away with paying uh, so little tax. So I think as a movement, we need to articulate our values. And that means whose contribution to society do we value most? And, you know, what are the, who should be the role models uh, in our society? I think the role models in our society are all around us in our community, not those at the uh, the very, uh, the very, very top, uh, the super rich who only seem to uh, have the desire to acquire more and more and more wealth at the expense of the majority in our society. Richard, thank you very much. We're going to go into the second round of questions and... I'm going to say that the speaker should take the opportunity in this second round of questions just to make a, you know, any kind of couple of sentences of final remarks that they want to make, because after after round two, we'll be beginning to wrap up. So I'm going to read the questions as I did last time and then come to you for just your question. So, Oslem, someone asks, how over the last decade have the rich become so much richer? Uh, Prem? Someone asks, did it used to be the case that companies were not allowed to buy their own shares? If so, what are the consequences of allowing it now? Highly technical question there for you, Prem. Um, Martin, uh, somebody asks, is there coordination between the unions to finally force the Tories out? I might have a few words to say on that myself. And, uh, and Richard, um, you clearly in your remarks mentioned privatisation. Uh, <clears throat> shouldn't we bring privatised services back in house to deal with the cost of living crisis and to help get down inflation? It doesn't say this in the question, but I'm gonna say it as well as the fact that it's just absolutely the right thing to do. But anyway, there we are. So um, first question to you, Oslem then, how over the last decade do you think the rich have, come, have become so much richer? Aslam. I love this question um, <laughs> and we have worked on this uh, because the rise in wealth inequality in Britain 
uh, is mind blowing and it requires explanation. Uh, I'm gonna post in the chat what we found uh, the, the, the lead to the paper we have written. Um, and of course, it's a very contested topic, just as the rise in income inequality, but the rise in wealth concentration is even uh, uh, more striking than rise in income inequality. The answers are, are though similar. I'll give you our answer first. Um, uh, the answer is in the trade unions. The fall in trade union density in Britain Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't know whether this is me or Uslem, but Uslem is frozen on my screen. It's just, it's everybody. Okay, right. So, so what does that mean, Lee? What, what should we do? If you've got the go, next, the next can question. To, can we yeah, go to well, Prem then in that case? Okay, th thanks, uh, Christine. Uh, it's a very interesting question. I briefly tried to answer it in the chat box there, but legislation enabling companies to buy back their shares was introduced way back in the 80s and 90s. The argument was that if a company has surplus cash and it does not what else to do with it, you should really return it to shareholders. They can do it in the form of dividend, but they also argued that there were possibly other reasons. Uh, so, so the law was changed to enable them to buy back the shares. One thing that then does is reduces the number of shareholders. It consolidates the control of the company uh, in, into relatively few hands. And dividends used to be taxed as income, fully income, and then somebody could claim a tax credit. In other words, the idea was tax was deducted at source. Whereas with share buybacks, the value of the share buyback can be, uh, can be treated as a chargeable capital gain. And as I said earlier, capital gains are taxed at a lower rate. So there are two aspects to this then. One is about enabling companies to distribute and consolidate the ownership. Second is a tax issue. I think the whole of this really needs to be revisited because as you reduce the number of shareholders, that actually makes company directors more and more powerful. There is less and less control on them. If, if the number of shareholders is seen as a, as, as a kind of a forum which secures accountability, then certain voices are simply not really there. So they are the sort of main issues uh, which I can uh, refer to at the moment. Um, thank you very much. I knew you would know the answer to that. Um, okay, Martin, so we're on to you about, is there coordination between the unions to finally force the Tories out? Now, I'm sure that lots of people on the call have been on uh, events called by Enough is Enough, uh, and, and clearly there is a lot of work going on on, uh, on trade unions seeking to work together on all of the action, both strike action and other action that they have now. So, Martin, have you got a few remarks on that for us? Yeah, Christine. Uh, I mean, in terms of the coordination, you're right. I think there's probably been more coordination in the last six months, certainly within trade unions, but also I think across the movement that we've seen um, for quite some time. And I think there's a reason for that, that people understand that actually the narrative that Richard was talking about in his earlier response about who is important in society, who are the ones who kept the country going during the pandemic, who were the ones that the, you know, those who were stuck at home depended upon, you know, was it the wealthiest? Was it the shareholders and companies? Was it big business? No, it wasn't. It was your delivery drivers. It was your care workers. It was your civil servants, you know, paying out benefits. It was uh, your, your, your education um, system keeping and, and looking after children in the most extreme and difficult of circumstances. And I think that's one of the reasons why this year we've actually seen, even in the media, a change and a swing round in that narrative, more of an acceptance and understanding amongst the general public. I think it's why the strikes haven't been a dirty word in this country for so many years. All of a sudden, the public get it. They understand why they're taking place and they understand why they, they need to happen. So that coordination 
has started and very much is something that we are building uh, during the weeks and will build during the weeks and months ahead. And I think a key uh, element to that is what happened at TUC only a few weeks ago, where I think that was one of the most progressive TUC congresses that we've had uh, for quite some time. And a unanimity around coordination and building that coordination, not just around industrial action and industrial action strategies, but actually getting the political message across as to why workers need to fight back and why it's important to fight back, I think is very much on the agenda. Events such as this, inviting trade unions to them is absolutely key. Working, you know, we've, we've in our union, we've got a brilliant PCS parliamentary group uh, where, where our, you know, we not only get our voice heard in parliament, but we do some great work uh, as well to try and build the narrative that I was talking and change the, the alternatives that I was talking about earlier on. So that coordination very much is there, Christine. I can see that doing nothing but grow in the weeks, months, and years ahead. It's long overdue, and let's keep building because we know we are stronger. That's great, Martin. Thank you very much. Uslem, uh, you've been returned to the screen. So can I just go back to you before we go to Richard to finish off your, uh, your remarks about how Thank you very much. My you. broadband provider probably didn't like my answer about the trade <laughs> unions. Uh, but yeah, the answer is the union, join a union. Um, what we found was that 42% of the rise in wealth inequality can be explained by the fall in the trade union power, trade union membership. Uh, we will be on strike ourselves and do teach outs uh, starting from this Thursday, Thursday this week, join a picket line. Um, but the, the other thing I want to add is sometimes this rise in wealth inequality is seen as a natural consequence of technological change. The rich have this very strong feeling of entitlement. They are the forces of innovation, drivers of technological change, and that naturally increases the returns to capital and thereby causes wealth inequality. But just be patient, it will trickle down to you. Well, A, it doesn't trickle down. B, technological change doesn't seem to be explaining this degree of wealth concentration. And neither does, by the way, globalization, despite the big surge in, of course, globalization, uh, both in terms of capital mobility, but also offshoring and different forms of international trade. It's all in the power of unions. When we have strong unions, unions redistribute income equally and thereby wealth doesn't concentrate. Uh, two other important things that did cause wealth inequality, uh, the rise in wealth inequality in Britain is privatization. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, financial deregulation uh, together along with that. And interestingly, the rise in home ownership is not driving wealth inequality down because uh, actually a lot of the wealth of this top 1% is in the form of financial assets or business assets. And final point, the fall in the top marginal income tax rates, as well as the fall in the taxation of wealth does lead to wealth concentration. Just maybe to finish on the final point, back in the late 70s, the average taxes collected on wealth as a ratio to total national income was about 2%. Today, it's less than 1%. So we have halved how much we are taxing wealth. The top marginal income tax rate of the top income, think about it like the income of the top 1%, was as high as 89%. Uh, well, today the Tories are making this big posturing that they have the 45% tax rate on top marginal income and they have decreased that tax bracket threshold to 125. This is all uh, too little, too meaningless in the historical context. So I will finish by saying tax wealth and we can invest in a green and caring economy for all. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Ozem. And I'm sorry we lost you briefly, but great that you were able to come back. So, Richard, on privatisation and insourcing. Yeah, so uh, privatisation has been a, a real scourge, and a scourge for our public services and a scourge for our society as well. Look at transport, for example. We all know how badly the privatised transport system uh, works in this country and, of course, privatised energy as well. Um now, in Germany and in Spain, 
what they've done is they've made public transport very cheap indeed. And so that's been hugely popular there. It also helps the uh, green debate as well, because it's helped to get millions of people uh, moving from the cars onto public transport. Of course, it's helping people during this cost of living crisis. Uh, in terms uh, of energy, of course, EDF is owned by France. And that means that uh, in France, uh, they've kept the energy price increase increases very, very low. So that means that their inflation is much lower uh, than our uh, inflation. And so obviously, I believe it'd be no surprise to you that uh, we need to, as part of dumping the neoliberal uh, economic model, uh, we need to um, advocate, campaign for and secure uh, modern democratic public ownership as part of moving towards a system that puts uh, people and planet first, people and planet first before the pursuit to profit. And there's big public support for this, including amongst uh, people who uh, usually vote uh, Conservative. So public ownership is popular. Public ownership does work. Public ownership is moving things uh, forward if it's introduced. And those that object to public ownership in the political and media class uh, are those who really object to it on ideological grounds because they do believe that everything should be run for the pursuits of profits. They do believe that the people who suck loads of money out of privatised key essential public services uh, are the so-called wealth creators in our society, whereas in fact they're not innovating at all. All they're doing is sucking uh, money uh, from uh, the public sphere and from the state in terms of the protections they get from the state if it goes wrong uh, in their privatised sectors. Um, you know, they're sucking uh, profits. They've got risk-free capitalism. So people talk about free markets, but the reality is in these privatised sectors, particularly privatised monopolies, you've basically got risk-free capitalism for capitalists. And of course, we've got to uh, object to that so public ownership has never been more necessary, never been more uh, important. It's very popular. And the failures of privatisation are clear for all uh, to see. And just to conclude, I think it's really important to have this discussion on the wealth tax today. Uh, great to hear from all our panellists. And this is part of trying to show that there is an alternative, because just as after the banking crisis, uh, we were told there was an alternative. And the question was, not if you cut, but how far and how fast you cut. We are going to be told now that there's no alternative to so-called difficult choices. The so-called difficult choices meaning establishment politicians taking the easiest choice for establishment politicians, which is to make the 99% pay workers, the disabled, um, pensioners, to make all people pay and our public services pay. There is a clear alternative. The money uh, is there, and we've got to make that argument clear, but also, crucially, it's not just about an academic debate, it's about organising to win that, organising to put as much pressure on the government as possible so they have to make concessions uh, and move towards the kind of agenda that we're uh, proposing. And obviously, when we get the Tories out, we've got to build the biggest mass movement possible to ensure that a Labour government that comes in um, understands that it's necessary to have a transformative economic policy, which includes making these choices on behalf of the majority as an alternative to pursuing the Tory cuts agenda. Richard, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we're, we're very close to wrapping up. So I'm just I'm just going to thank all of the speakers on behalf of uh, all of the participants, but also to thank all the participants without whom, of course, this wouldn't have been anything like the meeting that it's been. And uh, someone has pointed out to me that there's a, there's a comment that might be worth reading out, particularly uh, heartening, I think, at the end of the meeting, it says, I was the chairman, chairman notice, of Marlow Young Conservatives in 1970. I fully support all the policy suggestions made today. It's not true that all old people get more right wing with the years. Well, I couldn't agree more. That's certainly the case. Brilliant speakers. Thank you very much. So, uh, so that's that's it, someone who's uh, enjoyed being here and who clearly has uh, has moved in the right direction since 1970. Um, I'm just going to end by uh, by saying that um, I I can't close without saying how important 
I think the trade unions are. Those of you who know me know that I was the general secretary of a trade union. And in line with what, um, with what Martin was saying, I think the notion of social movement trade unionism and being not just about our paying conditions, but being about a better society is really important. And on that note, uh, the next online policy session that we're holding will be on the right to food. Uh, we're getting a date with Ian Byrne MP, who's been making all the running on this campaign. And we'll obviously publicize that as soon as we possibly can. Friends and comrades, thank you very much for joining this evening. There's a massive amount of hope in all the people who join these uh, who join these meetings and then go out and do things about them. But never forget, as Ian Labury MP says, they don't call it the struggle for nothing. Solidarity, comrades. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Bye.